as everyone is joining in the chat, if you would make sure that um, whenever you are commenting in the chat, you make sure and uh, change it. Sometimes it defaults to host and panelist. If you would change that to everyone, uh, that way we can interact with everyone here um, in our group. Uh, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself um, and tell us where you are joining from. See, we have a lot coming to us from Florida, and then I see uh, there's some people coming to us, uh, Michigan, Chelsea's in California. Let's see, we're all. Again, uh, welcome. Uh, make sure that your setting is defaulted to everyone and that you're able to tell us um, where you're joining us from tonight. It is 7.30, and so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I'm going to start by welcoming you all to the um, National Council for History Education, um, our Charting a Path Towards an Indigenous History of Florida webinar. Uh, we're joined by um, Dr. Denise Bosi from the University of North Florida. Um, and again, I, I just want to say welcome uh, first to our EDGE participants, um, welcome to NCHE and Project EDGE, and welcome to um, all of our other members um, and friends that are joining us from all across the country. Uh, we really enjoy having you um, be a part of these webinar series. We have another webinar that's going to be taking place tomorrow night. Um, that webinar is um, Brethren by Nature, um, and it is with uh, Margaret Ellen Newell, we have a follow, another webinar the following week um, as well. So we have a lot happening at NCHE um, and we'll be sure to post in the chat um, about upcoming webinars. We'd love for you to join us um, and again, get to interact with um, people who have a vested interest in history from all across the US. Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our uh, speaker for tonight. Um, again, Denise Bosi uh, is an assistant pre professor of history at the University of North Florida. Her award-winning research and teaching focuses on indigenous Florida, the local or the native South and local public and digital indigenous history. Her current book project, uh, Yamasi, Indigenous Mobility and Power in the Early South examines how the Yamasis navigated colonialism by making homelands in Florida, Georgia and the Carolinas. She's also starting work on a public facing indigenous history of the Northeast Florida with archaeologist Dr. Keith Ashley. This includes a digital companion site, indigenousflorida.com. Both book projects are funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, Bosi earned her PhD in American history at Yale University in 2007 and her BA from Princeton University in 1995. Also joining us tonight, we have um, Chelsea Gutierrez, who is our curriculum specialist for Project EDGE. And then my name is Dalton Savage, and I am the education coordinator for Project EDGE. As um, Dr. Bosi is presenting tonight, if you have a question, um, please make sure that you um, submit it. Um, there's a feature there where you can, um, again, uh, ask a question, and then at the very end of the presentation, we'll have some time uh, to go through and answer those questions. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Dr. Denise Bosi. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, and good evening. Um, thank you for carving out an hour late at night, uh, 7.30 to 8.30, um, to spend some time with me thinking about Indigenous Florida. 
Um, I want to second the call for questions. I'm gonna talk for about 40 to 45 minutes and leave plenty of time for us to talk about questions. I also wanna mention that I have quite a bit of experience with um, textbooks for K through five. I'm actually an, an advisor on indigenous content to a major textbook company um, that recently redid all of its Florida history books, uh, social studies for K through five. And I was the main indigenous advisor for Florida content. So a lot of what I'm gonna be doing tonight um, is talking from that perspective about how to reframe how we think about including Indigenous people in our state narratives of Florida. Um, a lot of it's going to be focused on this kind of bigger framing, um, but I really welcome particular questions both about that and specific parts of Florida, and I'm also going to be offering teacher resources, um, again, with an eye to really thinking about how we teach our children um, Indigenous stories of the past and present. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see uh, my PowerPoint. It'll just take me one moment to do that. Okay, um, if you cannot see the screen, please let me know um, so that I um, so that I correct that. But I think you should be able to see it now. So um, I'm starting with, and you'll see throughout the talk, several images by contemporary indigenous artists. And part of what I wanna draw attention to is the tension between how we talk about indigenous people as part of sort of the distant past with the reality that Florida is still very much um, what we call Indian country, a space that's very occupied by indigenous people who have been here um, for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, I'm gonna start with a land acknowledgement and you'll see um, scholars often do this. Um, when they give a talk, uh, scholars of indigenous North America or, or Central and South America. And the reason that we do that is to acknowledge the indigenous spaces that we're in. And this is something to think about also introducing your students to. I'm also going to start with a greeting in our local indigenous language here. It's in Tumukwa, and it is Hita Puenonake Terala Isako Nimane Akala. And this basically means welcome, y'all. Um, it is great to have you here. Um, and we are currently reconstructing the Tumukwa language. That's why I'm highlighting that. There's a website listed below the greeting I just offered where you can actually learn and teach your students Tumukwa words, phrases, and even um, whole you know, paragraphs. So this is the land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge that the University of North Florida and Jacksonville, where I am today, are on the un unceded ancestral homelands of the Mokama speaking Tumukwas. We recognize that other indigenous people also built homelands here, including the Yamases and Wales. For thousands of years, indigenous people made this region into a vibrant center of diplomacy, exchange, and religious practice. We pay respect to these nations and to their descendants. We further recognize the historical and ongoing impact of colonization in our region and state, as well as the resiliency of indigenous people. Today, Florida is home to the sovereign nations of the Seminole tribe of Florida and Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida, as well as citizens of other native nations and communities whose ancestors include Mokamas, Yamases, and Wales. And that last part, whose nations include, is really important because in my region, Northeast Florida, there's a notion that the Mokamas Yamases and Wales are quote unquote extinct, something that I'll be unpacking towards the end of today's talk. So I wanna frame what I'm doing today around three major problems that I see when I go into public spaces um, in terms of how regional, um, local and state um, organizations, including schools and textbooks frame um, indigenous history in the state of Florida. Um, and, and you'll see these problems are really persistent in every region and they really explain both why indigenous people are really erased from many of our textbooks and our museums and our national and state parks and also why it's so hard to put them back into it, which is probably what brings you here, right? It seems challenging to figure out how to get indigenous people back in. By understanding why and how they're left out of it, it becomes much easier to do that. So the first problem that we're gonna tackle of three today is the problem of chronology. When you go into um, any local state park, um, national park, uh, museum, specifically in my area, in particular in Northeast Florida, um, what you see are these flags, right? These flags often flying um, 
either flying as flags or often as part of a timeline, right? And they'll have the five flags that have flown over Florida or up to eight flags that have flown over Florida. Um, and in those flags are never indigenous people. Um, and part of that has to really do with chronology. So where do we start and end the history of Florida and whose chronology we use really impacts um, how we talk about indigenous people. Very often the history of Florida starts with sort of 1513 and Juan Ponce de Leon, you know, looking for the fountain of youth uh, allegedly and landing somewhere, you know, south of St. Augustine. Um, and that's usually where we begin. Um, there might be a small nod to indigenous people before that, but often that nod is very cursory and doesn't look at major developments before contact in indigenous societies. Um, and so what I want you to think about whenever you're teaching something and whenever you're reading a textbook is whose chronology is being used. Because there's not a singular chronology of Florida history or even US history. There are multiple different chronologies. There are multiple different starting and end points. And historians um, at the academic level certainly think about where they begin and end a story and how that really shapes who's included and who's excluded from that story. So something to really think about is chronology. So if we look at, um, at least in my region in particular, the history of human occupation of Northeast Florida, but also of Florida more generally, 97% of our state history is indigenous. And this is, you know, sort of going to the 1560s and saying that this is the beginning of a history that includes, you know, the French, the Spanish, the British, Americans, uh, Africans, and ultimately African Americans as well. I mean, we could argue it's 100% indigenous, but even looking at sort of to the point of contact um, and meaningful beginning of colonization, 97% of our state history is indigenous. So when we think about, again, that timeline and those flags that we often see in museums, um, they would look really different if 90% of that history was represented as indigenous and only then did we have sort of brief French, longer Spanish, brief British, you know, longer Spanish, and then American periods of occupation. And that really helps us to make an argument for the importance of not only including indigenous people in our state history, but also thinking about where we should start. Should it be at 1513? Should it be at 1562 when the French first try to establish a colony in present day Jacksonville? Or should it in fact be 14,500 years ago in essence, when we see the beginning of indigenous people moving through the region? So chronology is not only about where we begin and end a story, it's also about where we mark major changes in a story. So I'm not gonna offer a complete indigenous story of the state of Florida because that would obviously take much more than 40 minutes. But what I'm gonna do is highlight a major change in the US, the present day US, what was not the US at the time, that really affected indigenous people in Florida. And this happened around 10,050 common era. 10,050 common era. So, you know, this is 500 years before we see the French and Spanish begin to really make a, a concerted effort to colonize um, Florida. So in 1050 common era, um, in present day St. Louis, the biggest city to be established in North America before contact with Europeans was created by indigenous people. And this city was called Cahokia. Um, and this is an outline of what an artist, um, an artist rendering of Cahokia as we know it through a lot of incredible archaeology. And this is a World Heritage Site in present day East St. Louis today. It's an amazing place to go if you're ever in that region. Um, and they also have wonderful resources online and an incredible museum. I think they're currently going undergoing a lot of renovation to make it even better. And you can still go and see a lot of the monuments um, that the Cahokians built. So around 1050 Common Era, this major city was established in present day St. Louis. And it was established through a combination of folks who already lived in the region and also newcomers to the area who together created a radically new type of culture and a, and a new type of religion um, out of old, out of the old, but something that nonetheless was packaged in such an entirely new way that it seemed really revolutionary and radical, not only to the people living in Cahokia, but to indigenous people across the Midwest, what we think of as the Midwest, and into the South and into Florida. Um, and Cahokia probably had between 10 and 30,000 residents. Um, scholars vary on their, on their sort of range, the demographic range. Um, it was anchored by these large monumental mounds that were built out of um, soil and very carefully engineered 
um, by architects um, so carefully that many of them survive to this day. Um, the center of their culture was a, a new religion, uh, in essence, that was spread um, through conversation and objects um, and people traveling back and forth throughout the Midwest and South. Cahokia wasn't um, an authoritarian state, but it was the primary influencer in terms of culture and religion, things like agriculture, architecture, um, a lot of religious principles we see sh being shared increasingly around the Midwest and South and coming really out of Cahokia and then being made into sort of local versions in many different spaces. And this includes places like Appalachia. You can see here Lake Jackson Mound. So Appalachia was in fact part of what scholars call the Mississippian world. Um, the early Mississippian world established by Cahokia around 1050 um, really reached its height around 1250, 1300. Um, and in this period, we see the Appalachians developing a lot of the same um, agricultural methods. We see a lot of the same architectural markings, a lot of the same religious iconography um, in, in the archeological record. It wasn't only Appalachia, but also other parts of Florida that weren't in the Mississippian world proper, but that's nonetheless related to the Mississippian world. And this includes people in my region um, who are the precursors of the Tumuqua. Um, they were not Mississippians in the sense of practicing the same type of culture. And yet all the same, we see direct contact between um, my region here where I am today and Cahokia, you know, up uh, here in present day St. Louis. And the way in which we can see that is through objects, um, most notably this remarkable um, series of what were earrings, they're essentially ear spools um, that are Cahokian in origin. They were made out of copper um, and they were found in present day Jacksonville in the 1890s in a burial mound, something that we would never do today. Today, indigenous burial mounds are off limits in terms of archeology span because these are sacred sites. Um, where ancestors are buried with really important objects that are meant to stay with the ancestors and not be dug up. But in the 1890s, this wasn't the case. And this amazing pair of long-nosed god maskets, as they're called, because in the profile, the very long copper nose, were found here in present-day Jacksonville. There are very, very few of these that have been found around the Midwest and Southeast. And after a lot of careful research, archaeologists have realized that these were brought directly from Cahokia to Northeast Florida. So probably around 1100 common era, 1150 common era, somewhere in there early in Cahokia's history, these were brought directly to our region. Um, our region was really important here on the coast because um, we have access to the ocean, uh, which is a really sacred place and also produces sacred objects that you wouldn't have in a place like Cahokia especially whelk shells. Um, and you can see one here, both left-handed and right-handed whelk shells were traded throughout this Mississippian world and were essentially the canvas for sacred iconography, sacred images that were often carved into these shells. The shells could be used as um, parts of necklaces. They were also made into beads. The shells were often kept intact and carved upon and used as sort of sacred drinking vessels for rituals. And they were traded from Jackson, present day Jacksonville, all the way up to Cahokia. Not only was this a trade network, but it was also a religious network, right? With lots of ideas being shared. Um, this is a world that was profoundly connected. And so that's one of the big takeaways. When you think about why I'm talking about St. Louis and Florida, one of the big takeaways is that Florida's indigenous history is interwoven into a larger um, world indigenous history. And in this sense, the world that I'm looking at um, and that we're looking at around 1050 Common Era included St. Louis. And in fact, it was the main influencer, as I've said, of Florida in many ways. We can also see other people responding to Cahokia in a similar way in Florida beyond the Northeast, beyond Appalachia, which is in present day Tallahassee. The Calusas, for example, in Southwest Florida were arguably one of the most powerful polities um, before contact with Europeans and in fact, well into the 17th century, early 18th century, um, built amazing uh, canal systems. And archeologists believe this, these canal structures were in part inspired through their contact with Cahokians who didn't have canals, but who were innovating architecture in all sorts of ways. And we begin to see the Calusa sort of consolidating their polity, especially through canal structures, through engineering um, and science in response to what's happening in parts of St. Louis. 
So this is a world around 1050 Common Era that is very interconnected through webs of networks that stretch all the way from Florida up to present day St. Louis that include trade and exchange, religious discussion, religious change and transformation, um, also include the movement of people. This is really critical, not only the short-term movement of people like traders and ambassadors, but also the long-term movement of residents who move to different places. So for example, we know in the early Mississippian period, a group of women from Akmolgi, this Akmolgi Big Bend area, moved actually down into Jacksonville where they began to produce their own pottery expertly, but with local, um, local clay. And this tells us that they're not bringing the pottery, but they're actually making it here on site. So long before European contact, this is a really uh, profoundly connected world that is geared around, around movement, the movement of people, the interconnectedness of many different societies who are in conversation about many of the things we then assume only begin to happen with European contact. So this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about when we're talking about how to reframe chronology. The second problem that I see that happens a lot, uh, especially in public spaces, but also in textbooks, is the problem of geography. So the first problem was chron chronology and the way in which we frame both starting and end points of stories, but also key moments of change and assume that those are all European generated when we can see, for example, with Cahokia that that's not the case. The second is the problem of geography. And again, we often see a privileging of colonial or European geography and an exclusion of indigenous geography. This is a map by a wonderful scholar who's imagining what early Florida looked like and the early Southeast looked like. And what you'll notice is that these are entirely European settlements. Um, so the red indicate the Spanish, uh, the green, the French, and the blue, the English or later the British as they call themselves after 1707. And this is really common. I think this is the way that many people envision Florida when they envision the past. So we need to ask ourselves, whose places do we focus on in the past and whose places do we erase in the process? Um, and this is, again, the problem of or the question of geography. So I want you to think back just to a moment ago when I showed you the map uh, made by a wonderful colleague of mine who really erased Indigenous people and look instead at this alternate map, which shows those same spaces, uh, those same colonial spaces, but now embeds them in what the world really looked like, which is a profoundly populated um, indigenous world. And um, these are these are empty only because the scholars focusing on the South, right? We would imagine all of this would be occupied as well. And even things like the idea of a vacant quarter have more recently been challenged by one scholar. And I can talk about that in just a moment. So if we zero in on Florida here, what we see is a profoundly populated place, right? This is this is a, a, a space that Europeans arrive into um, that is uh, very well populated. One estimate for the Tamuqua population, um, and the Tamuqua population kind of occupied all of this, um, is that at, on the eve of contact with Europeans are about 200 to 300,000, sorry, 200,000 to 300,000 Tamuqua speakers at the time of contact. Um, and we see a lot of other communities too, a lot of other nations like the Calusas and Tequestas, um, the Ais come up quite a bit, uh, they're here, um, and the Apalachee that I've already mentioned, all the way into the Panhandle, the Jacado and the Pensacola. So a profoundly populated place. Um, and, and this is important to reimagining how we teach the past, right? Recognizing the limits of geography. And here we can zero in a little bit more. And I offer here also a really neat website for a resource, which is Native Land. This is a Canadian site that allows you to go on, put in any address where you are, um, or where your students are or somewhere else that you wanna look at in the world. And um, it will take you to show you the different overlapping indigenous occupations of that space. So it will, it's a map that allows students to visualize the space in a beautiful, colorful way um, as really profoundly occupied by indigenous people. And sometimes those visuals um, really do help. This is a crowdsourced uh, website. And so sometimes it has small errors that we can help to correct. But especially for Florida, it's fantastic 
It shows not only historic occupations like the Calusas and the Tumuquas, but then it shows present day, present day land claims by the Seminoles and Miccosukees. And so it really shows Florida as an indigenous space. And again, it's very colorful, um, very sort of exciting to look at and students can even put in their own address and go to it and see you know, whose lands they're living on, which is very helpful. I wanna contrast also that first map I started with that erases indigenous people with several maps by Europeans to emphasize that not only, um, not only do we today want to kind of recenter indigenous people in the history of Florida, but that also the Spanish, French, and British recognized and valued the occupation of these lands by indigenous people. One of the things to keep in mind when talking about colonization is that all colonial empires, so the Spanish, British, French, and others, sought out lands that were occupied by indigenous people. They were not looking for empty lands. And I think this can become um, sort of a self-reinforcing myth that we hear. It comes really out of colonial New England, where the justification for taking indigenous lands was that they weren't properly being used. And this has led in turn to several myths, including the idea that indigenous people didn't own land, which they certainly did. And also to another myth that there were all sorts of places where indigenous people weren't living or that colonizers were looking for empty spaces. In fact, it was the reverse. They were looking for profoundly populated spaces. They needed access to indigenous communication networks. They needed access to indigenous labor. To indigenous geographical knowledge um, and uh, indigenous indigenous bodies, because there's quite an active enslavement uh, and slave trade in indigenous people throughout the Americas, including Florida. In fact, the first Europeans to come to Florida were not Juan Ponce de Leon and his successors, but Spanish slavers who were um, sailing along both both the west and um, and east coast, looking for indigenous communities to pick off and enslave and take back to the Caribbean. So this is a Spanish map from 1683, um, and it is hard to see uh, archival maps on a PowerPoint, but this is very easy also to Google for, and then you can take an opportunity to kind of zero in. And I want what I want you to notice are all of these names and all of these little dots, which represent indigenous nations with whom the Spanish have had contact. And I say with whom the Spanish have had contact because historians are limited to what European colonial uh, colonists wrote down, and in turn were limited by what they knew. And they tended to pay a lot of attention to coasts and to not know as much about interiors. So often we'll learn a lot more about coastal indigenous populations, with the exception here, especially of like the Camino Real, oops, sorry, it popped back, um, and the road that the Spanish established between Appalachia and, um, uh, and, and Tallahassee, which is what we see here with my little wheel circling. So this is one map by a Spaniard in 1783. I'm sorry, my computer's decided to have a, a mind of its own. And then this is another map by the British, which isn't popping up. Okay, from um, set the 1720s, really made by someone who traveled in these regions between 1704 and 1715, and then later made this map um, to sort of document his travels. And he was, um, you know, British colonial settler from South Carolina. And what's fascinating about this map is that not only does it track a lot of different indigenous communities and trading paths, but it also includes a lot of different discussion of events that occurred on the ground. And these are indigenous events, contact with different indigenous communities, different, um, different wars, different uh, travel paths. And it's really an amazing map that not only shows how much the British were attuned to and interested in documenting indigenous communities, but also that they were literally writing, you know, the, the past onto the landscape through their interactions with indigenous people. And this is the final map that I'm going to show you in this trio. This is a French map made um, after the French attempt to colonize uh, present-day Jacksonville at Fort Caroline. And what's really interesting about this is once again, we see the French documenting in Florida all of these different indigenous communities. And this little square right here is Fort Caroline. And this Fort Caroline is in the middle of a big indigenous world. And this is not only documented in the map, but we also see the French, the Spanish, the British very much describing their world as profoundly populated by indigenous people and in fact oriented 
around indigenous people without whom they really don't have a shot of trying to establish colonies because they lack communication networks, they lack information about geography. Um, the French, for example, in this period really want to know where the Appalachian Mountains are because they believe, and that's up here, they've pictured it up here, they believe this is the source of silver and gold that they're that they're encountering when they meet indigenous nations throughout Florida, who have in fact acquired the silver and gold by wrecking, um, by salvaging from Spanish shipwrecks who have uh, whose boats have wrecked off the shore of Florida as they go from Central and South America back to Spain. Okay, so problem of geography is a big one. Problem of chronology is a big one. And the final problem that we're gonna tackle today, and then I'll get into actually an example that really help, helps to illustrate what I'm talking about is the problem of firstings. So in the late 19th century, in places like Jacksonville and St. Augustine and into the early 20th century, there was a real interest among um, especially elite white residents um, both snowbirds and per permanent year-round residents, and thinking about the past and thinking about how to commemorate the past and the present and how that gave them a sense of connectedness to places like Jacksonville and St. Augustine, and you'll see this uh, in other parts of Florida as well. Um, and this led to what one scholar calls the problem of firstings, where um, still to this day, we see many historical societies, many um, textbooks, many parks, national and state parks, claiming that first things have happened, or cities claiming that first things have happened there. Um, you know, this was the site of the first and oldest European city, for example, St. Augustine says about itself. And those firsts are always white. They're always um, colonial settlers who've established these. Um, and so we really see this begin to be a problem in how we imagine the past and how we displace indigenous people from that past in the late 19th, early 20th century. So here I offer two examples from my region. Um, this one is the Juan Ponce de Leon celebration that was established in the 1880s in St. Augustine to commemorate and celebrate um, the imagined landing of Juan Ponce de Leon in St. Augustine. We now know he landed much farther to the south around actually more like Cape Canaveral. Um, and uh, this was an annual celebration where people dressed up and played Spanish there were also um, folks who played indigenous, but that was for a very brief moment and they were quickly sort of displaced by the Spanish. Essentially their function in the ceremony in this public pageant was to hand over their land to the Spanish. We also see this in Jacksonville through um, the first history of early Jacksonville uh, written around, uh, published around 1911 by T. Frederick Davis and reissued in 1925. And um, this is an attempt to tell the past of Jacksonville really by highlighting how modern its white settlers were and are at the time. And so if you just keyword search for the word first, you will literally see a litany of this, the first street established in Jacksonville, the first church, um, you know, the first ferry, uh, the first road, the first hospital, it's all a list of how modern Jacksonville is because of all of its many firsts. So these firstings erase indigenous pasts and also erase indigenous survival. So it takes us to the third problem, whose stories do we tell? There are infinite number of stories we can tell about the past and we have to think carefully about whose we choose to tell because in the process of telling some, we're also erasing others. So I want to offer an example from my own research of how firsting has affected um, how we talk about Indigenous history in Northeast Florida and how we can begin to correct that to make it a more inclusive story. Um, and here I want to emphasize that the goal is not to erase colonial stories, but instead to say alongside understanding the French, alongside understanding the Spanish and the British and Americans, we also need to understand indigenous pasts. Um, and these will sound different, right? So an indigenous interpretation of an event will sound different from a Spanish or French interpretation of the same event because they're coming at it from different communities, different nations with different experiences. Um, and I think that's something to really take away from today's talk is that we don't need to have a singular story of the past. In fact, that's where we get ourselves into quite a bit of trouble. When we try to tell one story, we're silencing the possibility of so many other stories. So instead, I propose that we tell stories of the same event from multiple perspectives. And there are ways to encourage children to think this way. Um, one of the 
um, one of the exercises we came up with, for example, with the textbook company was to have each child in a group write their own chronology of their day at school and to see what, what was similar in the group and what was different. You know, each child will have experienced that day a bit differently. Um, and they will realize that they have a lot in common, but that they also have things that are distinct. So here I'm gonna talk about firstings and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the erasure of Mokamas or Tamukwa speakers from the story of firstings in our region. So I wanna start with um, who the Mokamas were. The Mokamas were um, Tamukwa speakers who lived on the coast of present day Jacksonville. And Tamukwa, this is sort of the boundaries of the language. Tamukwa was a language um, spoken by about 200 to 300,000 folks at the time of contact with the Spanish and French in the 16th century. Mokama was in fact one of the 11 dialects of Tamukwa. It means the sea. And it makes sense because this is a maritime community and they are speaking a maritime dialect called the sea. Um, and they think of themselves as part of you know, that community. Now we don't know what they called in fact their confederacy, which are in the 1560s was comprised of roughly 30 different independent towns run by oladas or chiefs. Um, but we know that they interacted uh, so although they ran their own towns and governed their own communities, they interacted, especially for foreign affairs, and they were knit together as a confederacy. So we use the term Mokama to talk about that confederacy, even as we recognize we don't know what they called themselves. We do know what they called their individual towns, but we don't know what they called themselves as a collective when it came to sort of foreign diplomacy. So again, the Mokamas were Tumukwa speakers who spoke the Mokama dialect, and in the 1560s, right when they're going to have contact with first the French and Spanish, they were a networked polity that was comprised of, again, 30 roughly independent towns um, run by Oladas, H-O-L-A-T-A-S, uh, who were uh, town leaders or chiefs. Some of these Oladas were women. And that often seems remarkable to people today. Um, I get a lot of interest in this when I talk about this publicly. Uh, the Mokamas had a large number of significant number of women who ran their communities. And they not only ran their communities as oladas or chiefs, but they also ran their communities as matriarchs. They were the heads of their families. So every family uh, in not only the Mokama, but Tumukwa speaking world, and in fact, across most of the native Southeast. So whether we're talking about Seminoles or Creeks or Cherokees or Appalachies, um, these were largely communities where women ran their families. Children took on the identity of their mothers. So instead of taking, for example, the last name of their dad, they took the last name of their mother, which was really the clan identity. So they were members of the clan that their mothers belonged to. Um, and women governed their households and they had a lot of power um, through that governance um, and played a critical role in diplomacy. Um, and the polity that comprised Mokama, those independent towns who came together as well at some level, were really uh, networked together through multiple different streams, but one of those was kinship networks, which were governed by women. At the head of the Mokama networked polity was a Paracusi or Paramount Chief, Paramount Olada named Satariwa, whose name is often known to a lot of people, especially throughout our region. He was not like an autocratic head of a state who told everyone what to do, but rather he was the head diplomat who helped to organize um, foreign affairs in particular. So he would he was often the point person for outsiders. He was often the point person for out organizing diplomacy and warfare with outsiders. Now, in addition to the Mokamas, later on, this is we're still in the sort of 1560s, later on in the 1650s and 1660s into our region also came two other groups the Wales and the Yamases. And this is important because we often imagine indigenous people as static, right? And as not moving much and as not changing much. And I want you to imagine the reverse, that they're both profoundly connected to the spaces in which they live and that they also move around a great deal um, episodically for things like trade and diplomacy and then coming back home. But also at times they move from homeland to homeland and the Wales and Yamases begin to move into our region in the 1650s and 1660s in direct response to colonialism. Um, and they do this because they have networks into the region already that connect them with the uh, Mokamas. The other thing to know is that the Mokamas and Wales and Yamases did not disappear 
in my region, there's a real terminal narrative of extinction. Um, and you'll see when you go to local museums and read in you know, local websites, this idea that uh, the, the Tamukwas or Mokamas and the Wallis and Yamases all went extinct. And that's simply not the case. Um, in the early 18th century, they largely moved out of the region because of an onslaught of violence, um, especially propagated by the British, and they joined the Muscogee Creeks and the people who would later call themselves the Seminoles. And today, both the Muscogee Creeks and the Seminoles um, claim the Mokamas uh, and Wales and Yamases, and in fact, Appalachies and others as ancestors. And we're going to talk a bit about that at the end of today's lecture as well. So I am sandwiched between two places, um, literally as I sit in my house in my house office, I'm sandwiched between two places that really commemorate firstings in the region, European firstings. The, um, to the north, about 10 minutes drive from me is Fort Caroline, um, which was established in 1564 by the French, lasted less than two years, but is still proclaimed by many as the site of the first Protestant colony in North America. And so um, here I offer a Jacksonville Historical Society website that you can go and find right now. Um, I pulled this up a week ago um, that talks about the way in which the Tamukwas, you know, in, ex exchanged gifts with the French. These are the Mokamas that I've been talking about. And then the Europeans offered their first Protestant prayer and that they were the first, you know, before the Spanish to be here. So again, a lot of firsting, a lot of firsting, and the erasure of the Mokama is largely from this. They serve really just as friends who facilitate French colonization, and that's not what you would see from a Mokama perspective. So this is a distinctly French perspective. The second place that I'm sandwiched between, um, which is 45 minutes to my south on the coast, is St. Augustine, um, which you've probably heard a bit more about. Um, both because it has a more robust his, sort of public history presence um, and does a lot of advertising about itself. Um, so this is taken from the Fountain of Youth Park, um, which is in present day St. Augustine. And it recounts a, a really a firsting narrative um, talking about how St. Augustine is the oldest continuous European settlement in the United States. And this happens a lot, um, both scholars and public historians of St. Augustine really try to position the city as older than Plymouth Rock and older than Jamestown um, and making an argument that the first Thanksgiving in the United States happened. Um, and they're actually saying in the Fountain of Youth Park. So a lot of those firstings. And I always tell folks when you hear the word first to really think critically about what's happening next, because usually it's a colonial claim that erases indigenous people in the process. So not only does the Fountain of Youth Park continue to um, commemorate itself in this way, but so does the city. Um, the city has fairly recently established a really beautiful public um, space, a little museum. When you park your car at the major lot, you go through the museum to get out to the main road. And um, it's centered around this idea that, it, that they talk about on their website. Founded in 1565, St. Augustine is the oldest continuously occupied settlement of European and African-American origin, which I want you to hold onto that for a moment. And then again, Jamestown, before Jamestown, before Plymouth, this is the nation's first enduring settlement. So, um, you know, indigenous people are erased in this, but also African-Americans uh, who are really African, who are really primarily enslaved Africans are now being claimed um, in an effort to make St. Augustine seem diverse from its origins. Uh, and this is a real erasure of the damage of colonialism. So I'm sandwiched between these two spaces. And um, one of the things that really drives the research that I'm doing, and I should say this is the new project that I'm working on with Dr. Keith Ashley, is this question of, you know, why are the Mokamas still excluded from narratives of the past and what can we do about it? And the reason we began to ask this is we got very interested in Fort Caroline, right? That first firsting, the 1564 French colonial settlement um, that lasted here less than two years. Now, the traditional narrative is that the French came in, established this, this colony, um, and the Spanish then uh, destroyed the colony in August 1565 in this sort of epic battle where Pedro Menendez, the founder of St. Augustine, marched his troops through you know, several days of hurricane level. I mean, it was a hurricane level uh, storm and um, furtively attacked Fort Caroline uh, and then um, found shipwreck survivors from 
from French boats and killed the rest of them over the course of two weeks, um, leading to really the first establishment of Spanish presence in the area. That's the traditional narrative. Excluded from that story are the Mokamas. And what perplexed us about this is that, as you can see, this is where the memorial is today. This is the national park that commemorates the French colonial settlement in our region. Um, my house is sort of down this way in Satariwa territory. Um, as you can see, it is in the middle of Southern Mokama homeland. So if we map the St. John's River and one of our tech folks did this incredible reconstruction of what the St. John's probably looked like in the 1560s, which was very different from today. Um, what you can see is that, again, it's in the middle of Mokama homelands. Um, and when you read the French accounts and read the Spanish accounts as they have, they persistently acknowledge we are in the middle of Mokama homelands. So why are they being excluded and what can we do about it is the question that's really brought us to a number of different projects that we've engaged with through our students. And I wanted to highlight this because it's really through teaching that we have begun to unpack these stories. And I thought that might be of interest to folks in the, in the area. So we're currently teaching our third joint seminar. Um, we're funded right now by the National Endowment for the Humanities and a collaborative research grant that involves indigenous nations as well as local um, partners like NPS. And one of the things that we're currently doing is working not only on our narrative of Fort Caroline, which we've recently completed from Mokama perspectives, but also how we reimagine the past. So if we tell that same story, a French colonial settlement effort and the Spanish destruction of Fort Caroline from Mokama perspectives, it looks very different. Um, the story is in its simplest iteration that the Mokamas allowed the French, who were to roughly two to 300 soldiers, to briefly establish a fort in the middle of their territory. And they um, actually selected for a settlement region, a place where the French could not grow their own food or catch easily their own food, because this is a very fishing oriented community. Um, they didn't have a good marsh, for example, the French, in order to create dependency on the Mokamas. So the entire time the French were here, they were dependent on the Mokamas for food, and this was by Mokama design. Because they had allowed the French to settle in a particular area where they would be controlled by the Mokamas, and the Mokamas had actually engineered and walked them through a treaty where the French agreed that as long as they stayed in Mokama territory, that they would ally with the Mokamas against their enemies. They were soldiers, the French. They had one woman with them and no ability to create the kind of matrilineal networks that, as we've seen, held the Mokama world together. So without women and with only soldiers, the only basis of their alliance was military. This relationship quickly fell apart because within two weeks, the French began to violate the terms of their treaty, allying with the Mokama's enemies, which the French openly acknowledge. By January of 1565, months before the Spanish arrived, the Mokamas had largely cut the French off of food supplies and communication networks. By June of 1565, the French had decided to leave and begun to dismantle Fort Caroline, the small wooden fort that they had built in the middle of Mokama homelands. And they planned, they were actually building ships to return home to France. In August, as they were literally about to leave, French resupply ships came with, col with a colony, a colony for the first time that included women and children. Um, but at the same time, the Spanish were approaching. And this was the moment of the epic battle. Had the Spanish not arrived, um, had the French uh, solely arrived, they still would have left the area because the commander of the French fort told the reinforcements, there's no way we can stay here. We have so destroyed our relationships with the Mokamas. So this story looks very different when we include Mokamas in it and tell it from their perspective. And so we've we've done this work, and I'll show you in a moment. We've got a website where you um, that is aimed at sort of fourth graders uh, and above, where you can actually walk through um, both physically if you go to Fort Caroline and also virtually just through the website. You can walk through Fort Caroline, and you can hear the entire story from Mokama perspectives, and learn a lot about Mokama culture at the same time about the depth of their culture, how their communities function, the role of women. You also learn um, Tumukwa words, uh, so it's very good for students in that way too. And the new project, part of the new project that you'll also see come up in sort of the summer and fall, is that we're taking some of the classic images produced as a result of the French attempt to settle in the region, 
um, they brought along with them an artist whose originals don't survive. What have survived are these engravings made in 1591 by a Flemish engraver. And these are supposed to be of the encounter that I'm talking about, of the French colonial encounter with the Mokamas and also of the Mokamas cultural world itself. What we know now is that these are largely wrong and largely false. There's been a lot of scholarship on them. So we're actually partnering with indigenous artists um, and these are not the productions, but just an example of, of how other artists have reimagined these images. But we're currently partnering with indigenous artists and having these all redone. And we're gonna make all of these images widely available to anyone um, copyright free. And those should be going up by November. Okay, so um, this is the website, Indigenous Florida where you can do a digital walking tour of Indigenous Fort Caroline. Again, it's aimed at students. We said fourth grade and above, but I think that younger children would be fine to do this as well. Um, you could also pick out elements of it that you wanna focus on. It's got multiple different tour stops, some of which look at the historical encounters between the French and the Mokamas, and some of which look at Mokama cultural worlds. Um, and so we'll hit some of your standards as well. So I want to end by returning to the problem of chronology and also leaving you with some resources that you might tap into as you're thinking about what to teach in your region. I do think one of the best ways to teach Indigenous history is to start by thinking about Indigenous history in your region and getting your students connected to the people who still live there um, or the people whose homelands you know, this was. But I want to end by returning to the problem of chronology, which is the problem of survivance. So one of the major false narratives that were often taught in Florida is that the Seminoles in particular are Creek Indians who migrated into Florida in the 19th century. Now, there certainly were Creeks who migrated into Florida in the 19th century, especially um, after the Creek Civil War uh, around 1814, like Osceola. But the Seminoles also include other indigenous Floridians the Seminoles include Calusas, uh, descendants of Calusas, descendants of Appalachies, descendants of Mokamas and other Tumuquas, descendants of Yamases and Wales. And the Seminoles know that, um, and in fact have lots of oral stories, oral um, narratives uh, about their ancestors. Scholars are doing more and more work that is showing this absolutely to be true. Um, I can tell you from my own research uh, that they're, they're a very diverse community like all indigenous nations in the native South were and are and included people who had lived in Florida since well before contact with colonists. So the people that we're talking about, the people that we look at in the past, they're, they're, just, they're ancestors of the Seminoles and Miccosukees today. Um, who have numerous ancestors, among them Florida Indians. And so that's really important to remember. Often we'll see Florida indigenous people being talked about in sort of select different moments, but instead I want you to consider that they are part of every part of the past that we look at, including the present. So here are some teaching resources that I thought might be really helpful for you, depending on where you live and who you wanna focus on. The Seminoles have their own lesson plans aimed at fourth graders and high schoolers, and they have also many other teaching resources at the Atatiki Museum, which is on Big Cypress Reservation uh, in South Florida. So if you're in South Florida, this would be a wonderful resource for you. You, of course, are welcome to use our Indigenous Tour of Fort Caroline. This is a website that we are building out and that will have many more resources in the coming years. Um, just in the next month, we're going to be putting on a whole museum exhibit that tells the kind of continuous history of indigenous Northeast Florida. That'll be up in about a month. We'll then have images coming by the fall um, that you're very welcome to use. There's also um, a big Tumuqua language program going on. We're reconstructing the Tumuqua language and you can use um, the different language lessons on here and teach your students some Tumuqua. Um, there are also Tumuqua history and lesson plans from FPAN, which is an archaeological network that are very fine. And then finally, Mission San Luis has some wonderful Appalachian history and lesson plans and videos. I've looked around at some other sites. Um, you'll find a lot of, even these sites might have problems. For example, the Appalachian has a timeline that begins with the Spanish. Um, you know, we're still in the process of figuring out how we teach Indigenous history from Indigenous perspectives. So all of these are um, really uh, things that are evolving and changing rapidly. Okay, just one or two more slides. So here are the takeaways that I would love for you to walk away with from today. 
adding indigenous people to how we tell our state's history means thinking about when we start history, what places we focus on, and whose stories we tell. And again, that's, this doesn't need to be exclusionary. In fact, I think it's better to be holistic. So we can tell multiple stories of the same event, but from different perspectives. And then finally, Florida's indigenous history is continuous. It both begins 14,500 years ago, at least according to archaeologists, and goes to the present, um, really without interruption, with, yes, serious colonial moments and serious moments of violence and loss, um, but also continuously. Okay. And here I just want to thank all of my many partners. Um, and as I begin to end this, I'm going to also um, encourage you to think about going to yet another webinar tomorrow. Um, the Organization of American Historians, which is one of the two biggest uh, organizations for historians in the U.S., has a wonderful webinar tomorrow on rethinking encounters. They're publishing a series of different um, magazine, magazine issues, and the first one has just come out. Um, I'm actually in that first issue. It is focused on indigenous encounters and sort of early America. Uh, I talk a lot about my Fort Caroline project um, in this special issue, and they're having a free webinar tomorrow from four to five, where many of us will be, all of us, all the um, contributors to this special issue, and um, will be talking about really how to teach indigenous history. Um, and this, but the special issue and the webinar are very much focused on teaching. And I've just put a link in for the OAH, the Organization of American Historians webinar. That's tomorrow from four to five, it's free to go. And I've also just put in a link um, that has the special issue. And you can actually read each article in the issue um, for free as well. So anyway, I really welcome your questions. I'm sorry I talked a little bit longer than I meant to, but um, I'm happy to stay for a bit and take any questions that you might have. No, thank you, Denise. Um... Dr. Bosi, that was really great. Um, I, we do have a couple of questions that I will get to. I saw one in the chat um, and then one in the queue. So if you have questions that come up, um, please place them in the chat or the Q&A, and then we will get um, to those. So the first question, it's a big question. Um, why is our history altered? Who makes these decisions? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So um you know, I talked about the ways in which in the late 19th, early 20th century, we really begin to see this problem of firsting. And it really comes with the development of, of local historical societies. Um, there's a great scholar, Jean O'Brien, who's looked at this in New England, and we can see this definitely in Florida. Many of my master's students did special projects on St. Augustine and Jacksonville. That's where that research comes out of. So we really begin to see this with the rise of early historical societies. Fast forward, you know, 100 years, we're still seeing that. So I still see in my area a lot of privileging of certain stories to the exclusion of others, rather than thinking, you know, we can tell all of these stories and we can add them in and we don't need a singular narrative. So that's really where the Fort Caroline project comes in locally is it's our attempt to see how that works. How does it work when there's a site that tells a French story, um, but you can also go and hear the Mokama story too and see them from two different perspectives. Um, in terms of textbooks today, you know, I think the textbook company that I work with is very interested in changing this and telling multiple stories, but they often aren't quite aware of the things that I've pointed out, that they're using a colonial cr chronology, that they're using colonial geography, that they're doing some firsting. And once you tell them, they're really, really excited to think differently about how they construct the past. But I think we've naturalized a lot of that so that we don't even question, you know, all of that framing. And that's why I've emphasized the framing today, because that's really the most important step to beginning to think about how to tell these stories in a more holistic way. And it's not just indigenous stories that can be that that we can use that to include uh, more meaningfully, but really anybody's uh, story who's being excluded in any way. Thank you. Um, we have another um, question. Do you know any good sites um, for Tequesta, which is closer to home for us here in Broward? I didn't find any to good. I did look at some sites that had Tequesta and others. Um, I didn't find any that I would approve of so far, but I did take a look. You know, there's a lot of material out there. And I think as long as you use the principles I'm talking about, you can critically reassess um, how to use those, those sites. What I find is a lot of emphasis on culture because that's what the state 
mandate asks for, right? The state standards ask for indigenous people be, to be taught through a cultural and environmental lens. I'm gonna encourage you to do that, but also to teach them through a political lens, that that's really important too, to see them as active political actors who shape col colonization, who shape their, the, their deeper past. Um, and so I think, you know, there are sites out there with content, but just nothing I felt comfortable endorsing so far. Okay. Um, the, we also had a question about the webinar for tomorrow. Um, if it's going to be recorded, if you happen to know. Oh, the women. Are, yes. They, they put it on YouTube. I believe they have a YouTube channel. Okay, perfect. And then there's one more, um, question that I have. Um, this one is, um, again, why does Florida still fail to teach the true, um, the, the true history, history for indigenous people? I think there's a big gap between what academics do and then, you know, what is accessible to a broader public audience that includes textbook authors, um, you know, wonderful K through five, K through 12 teachers. Um, for example, in my region, you know, I think the museums and local parks don't want to tell a false narrative. I mean, that's what I found. They're very excited to change. Um, in the Fort Caroline project, we've partnered really closely with the National Park Service, um, and they're thrilled at what we're doing. Um, there's just that gap between the work that scholars do and, and sort of public consumption of the past. And um, that's, that's a responsibility I think scholars have. So that's a lot of what we're trying to do is move into that space between scholarship and the public and really try to promote you know, good work that's very accessible. So our book is going to be written for a very general audience, even as it's got very cutting edge research. And that's just not something that scholars, something that scholars are doing more and more, but haven't done for quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again. Um, one thing that I want to mention to our EDGE participants, um, and Chelsea put it in the chat for us, is uh, to get your attendance for tonight, you're going to want to make sure and go to the Canvas page and fill out your Google form, uh, which is your reflection. Um, it's due by end of day next week. There's some guidelines for your reflections there. Um, but I just wanted to, again, say thank you, um, Dr. Bosi, for um, your work uh, and for providing this insightful webinar for um, us and our history community. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and be cognizant of time and uh, we will end here. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, and we uh, really enjoyed having you. Thank you. I so enjoyed being here. I wish I could have seen all of your faces um, and I really appreciate you being here.